All right, this video is going to be about Trey Five because you guys got me confused. All I hear all across the internet is how Trey Five snitched on McAdoo and Lil Scud. Now, in reality, if you stick around the next 30 minutes or so with the video I just made, for you to say that Trey Five snitched on them, you would have to say Trey Five snitched on himself. Are you confused now too? I'm just saying. Who did he snitch on and why? Did he snitch on himself? All right, earlier today, I noticed that SNTV had done this video and it was kind of sort of like a video that I was working on. At least it was on the same topic. And being Sal, it's already had 15,000 people view it. What I've done is I've gone back and omitted a lot of my video because there's no sense of repeating the same thing. Now, for those of y'all that haven't seen his video, I'll leave a link to it in the description box. So I'm just going to cover the stuff that he didn't cover. Okay? That way, y'all are not getting the same thing twice. So what I'm going to do here is read this article that was printed in January of 2020. Now, the case took place in 2017. So this is a few years later. And this is to kind of give you an update also. It says, motive in ambush killings of two moms remains a mystery even after the second man is charged. Kevin Brown and Machiavelli Sampson are accused of shooting Juliet Watts, Washington and Janine Dow in June of 2017, but authorities have yet to say why they think that the women were targeted. And there it shows, it says, um, it was an ambush-style shooting and that the guys are now facing murder charges. Now, mind you, this is in 2020 written. On a stormy night in 2017, Juliet Washington and Janine Dow were sitting in an SUV at a red light in the Washington Park neighborhood on the south side when both were shot multiple times in ambush-style attack. As their SUV rolled onto a sidewalk, two shooters got back into their car and drove away. Washington 41 of suburban Woodridge, Woodridge was a mother of two who worked as a mail carrier. Dow, 32 of Roseland, was a mother of three whose daughter nicknamed her Miss Make It Happen for her dedication to her family and making sure her family's needs were met. Since two charged, but the motive remains a mystery. Last week, the alleged second gunman in a heinous crime, 24-year-old Kevin Brown, was charged with murder and denied bail during a hearing in the Leeton County Criminal Court building. Brown's alleged accomplice, 22-year-old Machiavelli Sampson, pled not guilty in February last year to 12 felony counts, including murder, in the case court records show. Prosecutors allege that about 10.30 p.m. on June 28th of 2017, Brown and Sampson pulled up, to a stole, pulled up in a stolen gray sedan behind Washington's stopped SUV at Wabash Avenue and Garfield Boulevard, then got out of the car and approached the SUV on foot with handguns. For roughly 15 seconds, Sampson fired 14 times at the driver's window where Washington sat, and Brown fired eight times at Dow, who sat in the front passenger seat, prosecutors said. Her oldest daughter, Washington's oldest daughter, who asked that her name be withheld, said she felt a sense of relief flood through her when she learned a second person was finally in custody. I felt like I could breathe again, she said, walking around, it was like I didn't know if they could be straight right behind, straight right next to me. 
When news of Washington's murder spread to the Westmont Post Office, where she had worked for 17 years, her co-workers were devastated, the branch postmaster, Sunita Robinson, said. She was a great person. It was a tragic what happened, and it was a very big hit for every employee. On the day of her funeral, employees from other branches came in to help keep the branch running so that Washington's co-workers could attend. Stepping up in a time of need would have been something Washington would have done, her family said. She, has, she was a hardworking person, but also she was good-hearted. She was really a person that would help anyone. She just would. On the night she was killed, Washington had spent the day with her two daughters in the city at the apartment of her eldest, who was in college at the time, making cabbage and macaroni and cheese together. It was my favorite meal, and she came to cook for me. I had just gotten a new camera, and I was taking pictures of her with it. We had a good time. Washington left and went to go pick up Dow. The two women were longtime friends, having grown up on the same block, less than a five-minute walk from where they were killed. As they grew older, they had also grown closer, Washington's daughter said. Washington called later to tell her oldest daughter she was on her way back to pick up the youngest. It was the last time they spoke. My auntie called me and said, I don't know what happened, but I think your mother got shot. I was baffled. I was in shock. Tracking the killers. A driver who was across the intersection and witnessed the shooting followed the gray sedan for a half a mile to an apartment building where he directed officers to the car less than two minutes after the shooting, prosecutor said. DNA recovered from the passenger side door was later matched to Brown while fingerprints recovered from the door on the driver's side matched Samson. There's also surveillance footage and witness statements alleging implicating the men. To date, neither Chicago police nor Cook County prosecutors have offered possible motives for the crime. We have overwhelming evidence to prove the murder, but no motive was given to us by the defendant. At the hearing for Samson, prosecutors said in the hours before and after the murders, he had made 15 calls to a person who faced a charge of aggravated battery against Dow. That person, who was not identified, was ultimately convicted in the case after her death, prosecutors said. Prosecutors declined to commit further. Now, the problem with that is me looking up records, the person who committed aggravated battery against Dow had already been arrested, charged, prosecuted, and found guilty and was doing the time for it. So I'm not sure why they're saying, acting like if it just now happened, because that happened all the way back in 2011. But we're going to get into that. OK, now let me show you a little snippet about 30 seconds of SNTV's video, because this is the same narrative that I've heard over the years uh, on other videos. So it's kind of like this is a common knowledge thing to be almost factual. And then I'm going to show you what the problem with what they're saying is. So basically, the police are saying that they believe that McAdoo was paid to do the hit on white girl. It would eventually come out that it was video footage and a lot of people willing to testify. Allegedly, one of those guys were real close to O Block at 600. As a matter of fact, one of those guys turned out to be O Block. And it's been said that Trey Five was telling and that he made a whole statement about the situation. Statement. Okay, now on SNTV's video, if you watched it, you, he read this whole paragraph to you up here. Now, I hope y'all watched it because I'm not going to read that whole thing again. I'm going to read the next paragraph. 
because it's the next paragraph that says that the person that they're referring to in this paragraph here, that they showed them a photograph of McAdoo, okay? Blank stated it was a photograph of McAdoo who Blank called Mac. Blank wrote Mac under the photograph and signed it. So then the detective signed it as well. Blank was shown a still capture photograph depicting the white Chevrolet Malibu parked on Calumet on June the 28th of 2017. They wrote something, my, uh, something that says car register or registrate to my other something and signed under the photograph. Now, if you come down here, they didn't redact this part. It says, blank was shown a copy of the Leeds printout of the white Chevy Malibu registration blank, period. Blank wrote my brother's car registration and signed the printout. So whoever they're speaking to, the car actually belongs to their brother. Okay? Now, I don't know enough about Trey Five to know if this is him speaking or if this is his brother's vehicle or what. What I do know is that he is the blood brother of Vaughn and there is another brother as well that uh, I've heard them speak about. Now, is that who they're speaking on? I don't know. What I do know is this. Now, this case gets kind of complicated because they call in so many people as witnesses. It's unbelievable the amount of people, uh, uh, statements that are made. But this particular person says that he is the blank of blank. I've got a feeling that this is the brother of whomever it is that was being questioned. And they said blank stated he was with blank on the 28th of June, smoking and drinking at the park, at Parkway Gardens. Blank stated blank received a phone call, then asked to bar they asked to borrow the car. Blank stated that blank asked for the car three or four times before blank agreed and went with blank. Blank stated that they used his white 2008 Chevy Malibu. Blank stated that the Malibu was registered to his blank. Blank, but he used the vehicle. Blank stated blank drove the vehicle to 58th and Calumet and used the phone multiple times. Blank stated that they parked the vehicle and that Mac McAdoo, who Blank knew as Mac, got into the back seat of the vehicle. Blank stated he does not know of Mac, he does not know Mac well and does not associate with him because there's a big age difference. Blank stated the radio was on and he wasn't play, paying attention to Mac. Blank did not hear Mac say anything to Blank, but it is possible that he said something quietly that Blank did not hear. Blank stated that he saw police vehicles on Calumet. Blank stated that there were three of them, that the three of them went to Parkway Gardens where everyone went their own separate ways. Blank stated he did not see McAdoo on the 28th before they picked him up on Calumet Avenue. And Blank did not see McAdoo after that. Then they interviewed him again, but it was uh, the state's attorney general's office. Blank stated that he is the blank to blank and stated that the 2008 Chevy was registered in his name and that blank had used the vehicle. Blank stated he understood why detectives wanted to talk to him because the vehicle blank blank used that night was registered in his name. Blank blank stated he believed he was at Parkway Gardens with Blank and Blank at some prior point on the date of the 28th. Blank Blank stated he remembered that it was daylight still, but he doesn't remember if he was around at nighttime. Blank Blank stated he now lives in Florida near Tampa Bay with his girlfriend. Blank Blank gave his phone number as Blank 
and stated that his number has not changed in five years. Now in this part, it says on August the 20th of 2017, McAdoo was arrested, gives a case number. Now that's another thing. This file has so many case numbers related to it. I've never seen one that has this many, but I'm gonna go over some of them with you in a minute. Um, they talk about his Facebook and how it's linked up to a certain phone number. And then it shows that in the Facebook that he had on a red hoodie that was matching a red hoodie that they saw on the footage over at Park, Parkway Gardens, okay? They also let him know that his fingerprints were lifted from the stolen car. They were able to match those up through forensics. So basically what's being said in the statement is, is that after everything took place, McAdoo called somebody to come and pick him up. They drove back over to the crime scene to make sure that the job was done. Some people say that the hit that McAdoo and Scud allegedly did on White Girl and TT was kind of like killing two birds with one stone. Because White Girl was also MOB, as MOB definitely claimed her after her death. And they made a lot of posts honoring her and saying that 600 was actually bogus for doing this hit and that they wasn't going to get no points for it. Now, just like the article had said, I heard the same thing through other people's videos that they were targeted because of some pending charges of uh, aggravated assault that had taken place against white girl. Well, let me show you where the problem comes into play with that. All right, these are just some of the case file numbers that are in this case file. And some of the arresting numbers. And of course, I cross-matched them with my files. Okay, so you can see here on December 19th, 2017, he has the arrest number of 1957-8448. But then we move down over here, we have 80, uh, 1957-8448 under two different charges. The bottom one says, with the case number of JA555065, it's a BMW with the firearm, which basically they, he left a, a gun in the car that traced back to him. The top one says murder in the first degree, but there's no case file number. It's only an arrest number. Okay, keep that in mind. But then as you can see here on his Cook County charges, it just says, the aggravated unlawful use of a weapon and in a vehicle without the Floyd card. So if I'm reading this correctly, on December the 19th of 2017, he was charged with murder in the first degree, but he just was not arrested for it, which makes absolutely no sense. Okay, so I come back over here to these list of case numbers, and I can cross off the two that we just read off there. That way we know, okay, we know where those came from. Now here on January the 9th of 2018, the arrest number is 1958-5921. And we move down here, same arrest number, and it has the case number of JA-326821, same date, murder in the first degree. So this is totally a whole different murder according to the case file number. And according to Cook County, he was arrested for two murders. Now matching up that case file number, that goes to the white girl and the Washington lady to those two double homicides. So he wasn't arrested and charged with that until January of 2018. So then we come back over here. Those two are already scratched off, and now we can scratch off the 326-821. All right? So we got that. So then now we have this one, 1992-3708. 
who was arrested in January of 2020, which that makes sense because that's what it said in the article. If we come down here, everything matches up for the rest, the case file, the whole nine yards, first degree murder. It doesn't say double, but it says first degree murder. Now looking at the Cook County records, it does show a double homicide on the bottom left. But if we come over here and we look at the bottom right, we can see that this is his history and what he had been doing over the years prior to this double homicide, at least that he was caught for. Okay, so we have those three knocked out and now we can knock out the fourth one here. So where does that leave us? Let's go back to the other one. Now, on this one here, it's not telling us who it is that the murder in the first degree is for. So I guess that is just going to be kept a secret with CPD until we just find out through some paperwork in the future. But now let's go back to the original 2011 case. Now, as you can see here, this is from November 28, 2011. The case number is HT608663, the aggravated battery with the firearm. And there is an arrestee number of 1828-9105. So let's see who that is. And that was Daquan Bennett, better known as Trey Five. So as you can see here, Trey Five was charged with the aggravated battery to white girl. And he was sentenced to six years in prison, which he did. And then he got out and he picked up some new charges and was back in custody August 20th of 2017 before their murders. So now that puts us back over here. How could that have been Trey Five speaking with them or driving with them or anything with them when he was locked up in the penitentiary? So we can see here that August 28th of 2017, they went and got some more surveillance footage and It says that the male suspect now has a limp and had struggled to walk. Then it goes on to talking about some robberies that took place that same month. And within a matter of minutes, there was a, a hijacking two minutes after the armed robbery. And they were speaking to someone, a female with the last name of Harris about these things because, in fact, he had been meeting up with her in between. Now, the more, when they did their autopsy, it showed that they found an oxidized bullet in the abdomen of white girl and found out that it had been there from November 28th of 2011. There's that case number that I showed y'all. And it says that they conducted a victim search on her and found that she was the victim of an aggravated battery with the firearm. Case number, it says that they were in a van, several other females, two offenders started shooting. Uh, she was struck twice in the back and another lady was struck in the wrist. The two offenders were identified and arrested. They were charged and convicted and is currently incarcerated at Danville Correctional Facility. That would be Trey Five. And the other one is paroled from Vandela. Unless I've gotten them wrong or backwards, I don't know because the records are not showing where he was locked up at for the charge because of 
him already being released and picking up new charges. That would be the only way that it could have been him. Because whoever was paroled, they were paroled in 2016. Now, the rumors that I've heard were that he wanted to put a hit out on her because she was going to testify against him. Why would she need to testify against him if he was already punished and did the time for what he did against her? That doesn't make any sense. So obviously, there's something else going on. Now, when we come back over here to these case numbers, I cannot find the, the full records of it, but this is the case number, and it happened in August the 8th of 2017 is when McAdoo got shot twice in the leg. Now, McAdoo being shot in the leg, walking with a limp, is kind of what helped them figure out that he was the one in on the double homicide because of the red hoodie that they found him wearing it matched up to something on Facebook that he had a photograph of. There's, like I said, there's a lot of, lot of statements in here and a lot of, lot of evidence. All right, so let's go back to the beginning because there's several details that I've never heard anybody else mention. So when this first took place, it says the responding officers responded to the above location for a person shot. Upon arrival, the EMTs were already there on site. Janine Dow, the victim, and Juliet Washington, the victim, were unresponsive inside a maroon Chevy Equinox. With the window shot out and several gunshots in the driver's rear panel, Janine Dow was in the passenger seat and sustained a gunshot wound to the head and back. Juliet Washington was in the driver's seat and had sustained a gunshot wound to the head. The ambulance and the EMS uh, fire truck, I'm sorry, arrived shortly after. Both victims were pronounced at 2238 by Dr. Sharp at University of Chicago Hospital. Blank blank witness informed responding officers that he and the victim's vehicle were stopped at a red light at the 5500 block of Wabash, facing northbound. Blank blank witness stated that the victim's vehicle was behind his. Blank blank stated that he heard approximately 10 shots fired and the victim's vehicle being driven by Juliet Washington rammed into the back of a parked vehicle in an attempt to avoid the shot being fired. The parked vehicle is a Chevy Cruze, and it gives the plate number and the VIN number and all that. The victim's vehicle then proceeded northbound and veered to the left of the road, resting on the sidewalk at 5430 South Wabash. The traffic crash was reported under JA 326906. The witness was in the rear compartment of the victim's vehicle at the time of the shooting. The witness states that he heard shots fired, then he lay down in the rear to avoid being shot. He did not see who was doing the shooting and was not injured. Uh, one of the officers obtained information about a possible, offender, possible offender's vehicle, which was a blue Nissan was discovered at 5713 South Calumet, Calumet with a black mask and a cell phone on the back seat of the vehicle. Further investigation revealed that the vehicle was stolen on the 26th of June, and it's reported under JA 324 496. Uh, then they took it to the scene. Oh, they remained at the scene until the vehicle was processed by the crime lab. The witness continued on home after the traffic crash, but his vehicle had some blood splatter on it, which had evidently, 
evidentiary value. Therefore, his vehicle was also processed by the crime lab. The scene was guarded by another officer. Where then it just goes on to talk about which officers were guarding which part of what scene. Now we're going to jump down to December 20th of 2019 when they found out that DNA from the front passenger side door handle was matching up with a Kevin Brown. So he was arrested for possession of a stolen vehicle on July the 6th of 2017, eight days after the double murder. Brown was sentenced to four years in the Illinois Department of Corrections for multiple offenses. Brown was released in 2019. The detectives learned that Brown is a documented member of the Black Disciples of O Block faction. Their associates is 600 Brick City. Brown has multiple common associates of Machiavelli Sampson via arrest and show, social media posting. Brown's co-offender during the possession of the stolen motor vehicle arrest. Hakeem Murray, HK, was shot and killed while in the company of Machiavelli back in November 2017. So if you understand that correctly, you have Brown's co-offender was HK with a stolen vehicle. And then they're saying Machiavelli was present when HK was killed. And it gives those case numbers. And it says, December 28, 2019, they interviewed the owner of the stolen Nissan and showed him a picture of Kevin Brown. She said she did not know him, and nor did she give them permission to ha use her vehicle. They went after the Facebook profile account. And it says, multiple photographs of the account appear to be Brown including Brown's Illinois Department of Corrections booking photograph. Posted dating back to June 28, 2017, the date of this incident, stating what motherfuckers on, what motherfuckers at, where motherfuckers at. June 2017, depicting an individual that appears to be Brown with multiple other males holding handguns and pointing at the camera. January 15, 2020, Brown's Facebook shows uh, they found a, a photograph dated from 2017 depicting Kevin Brown wearing a gray hoodie sweatshirt, similar to the gray hoodie sweatshirt captured on the surveillance video. Uh, the detectives noted a private conversation in which Blank is inquiring who was out, to which the individual replies, it was Blow, Buka, Mac, Manny, Muwap, DQ, Little Lotto. Little, little, sorry. Referencing multiple members of the Black Disciples gang, including Matt, nicknamed Machiavelli Sampson. So they interviewed Kevin Brown and showed him a picture of Hakeem Murray and Brown said that he did know him. And then when they showed him a picture of McAdoo, he said he did not know him and had never seen him before. And then they showed him a picture of somebody. Brown stated he did not know him. They displayed two separate photographs, the stolen Nissan. Brown stated that he had never seen that car or been inside that car. Brown further denied knowing anyone who owns that kind of car. When he was confronted about the DNA evidence, he said he wanted to speak to his attorney, and the interview was immediately terminated. Then he wanted to go to the restroom, so they took him, and on his way back out, he decided he wanted to speak. And he tells the detectives, he says, that's just crazy because I got an odd phone call. A call said that the DNA was found on the stolen car and that the call was a day or two ago. Brown stated that Mac had a court date. Detectives stated that Brown didn't know that until the detectives told Brown. Brown said, no, I did know that. 
Brown stated his lawyer called him whichever day Mac had court. Brown then stated it was a lawyer he did not even know, and the lawyer did not even leave his name. Brown then stated that I guess whatever y'all come up, whatever y'all come up knew with, y'all presented to the court. Brown stated the call was in the evening time after court. Brown began to cry. Brown asked if he could go to trial with Mac, if he would go to trial with Mac or separately. And then a little bit later, an attorney showed up and spoke with Brown, and Brown said he was invoking his right to remain silent. Sounds like somebody hired that attorney for him. Then in January is when he was charged with two counts of first degree murder. Now, like I said, they have a lot of evidence. You can see where uh, they were both associating with each other on Facebook, the phone conversations, they got the phone, the whole nine yards. And here's a bunch of private videos that they got, some of the uh, footage off the streets and stuff. To be honest with you, to properly go through this case file, we would need three or four hours to cover everything. So going back here to tray five, again, Unless anybody can show and with proof that he was out on parole or something at the time of this homicides, double homicides, there's no way that he could have committed them because, again, he was serving time for the aggravated uh, charges against white girl. And then what would he have to gain by doing something against her if he was already out on parole? Now, if you think about it like, okay, well, it's a get back for him getting locked up, then in reality, that would just be kind of like him snitching on himself because it's going to make him look guilty because he's the one that did the aggravated assault. But again, I've seen these guys do some sillier, goofier things that make you scratch your head and you can't figure it out why. But as far as snitching on McAdoo, if in fact he did get McAdoo to commit this double homicide, how would he have explained to McAdoo why he would have snitched McAdoo out for it? That doesn't make any sense either. So I'm going to leave y'all with that and let y'all think about it and y'all give me y'all's best guess down in the comments.